Good morning, everybody. One more time. Come on, guys. Good morning, everybody. You've had more coffee than I have, so that better be loud. I am thrilled to be here with you today because I have been given the opportunity to talk about my obsession, which is about small-scale manufacturing and how we are seeing revolutionary changes day by day right now having to do with this work. I'm with a nonprofit called Smart Growth America. We work nationally with communities, with states, particularly at the government level, looking at how do we change policies to help support reinvestment and redevelopment in our cities? How do we bring suburbs up to what they need to be today? And we work with elected officials, real estate developers, and nonprofit organizations to get there. Today I'm going to tell you or talk to you about why this has to do with this and what they have to do with a guy like this, John Y, and a woman like this, Natalie. And the part where I think it's going to get even more interesting is because it all comes down to this, great places. Because what I am telling you is that making things, producing things, is a key part to our cities. And that it's a key part to having a strong economy in our cities of today and tomorrow. And there are new ways of making that happen. We know, just to briefly make sure we're all on the same page in terms of trends, we know that there are huge demographic changes. We know that more people are in the cities, more people want walkable communities, our community is aging, and the millennials are voting with their feet to move to places where they can walk to see their friends, gathering places, surveys from the National Association of Realtors, the Urban Land Institute, you name it. The demand has shifted in the last 20 years in a way that I don't think any one of us could have predicted. And people are looking for places that they're included in. An inclusive community is one of the hallmarks of the soul of the community study, why people are tied to the communities that they're in. We also know that businesses are moving into these cities because they know that's where their employees want to be from Las Vegas to Detroit, obviously. We have major headquarters moving back downtown because their employees want to be in vibrant places. They want to be where there's restaurants and bars. And many people coming out of college are choosing a city and then looking for a job, we know from lots of research. But it all also comes back to the advent of the maker movement. And I don't know how many of you have paid attention to the maker movement or have been to a maker fair. People are making things again, right? They're making things with their hands. They're using welding equipment. They're using 3D printers. People are inventing things. And they're not just doing it on their own. They're doing it in big groups. And it's become cool and totally inclusive. And we're seeing spin-off businesses come out of this movement that are becoming job creators, job creators that you don't need an advanced degree to be able to create this business. Job creators that you can live anywhere in the country to create because tomorrow you can sell it on the internet anywhere in the country and anywhere in the world. These businesses are small. They're uh, averaging fewer than 20 people. And we know that generally they're sourcing materials locally and they're creating higher wages for people. Think about someone who can create a business where they're creating furniture or wood products versus working at the McDonald's. Their incomes are going to be about $50,000, $60,000 if they're producing their own goods, much better than the minimum wage they're going to get at a retail store. A lot of this is possible because people are looking at a new real estate development product type. And I call that mixed use industrial. I haven't found anybody else talking about it, so I got to make up the name. And there are a few people who are out there at the forefront of this. And I'm going to talk about three different examples of them. One is a new product coming from Forest City, a real estate developer that does huge projects all over the country. This is their Pier 70 project in San Francisco. This is a projection of what they want to look like. It doesn't exist yet. But the centerpiece, the centerpiece of this whole project is small-scale manufacturing spaces. And they're going to put residential and office around it. It is the centerpiece of what they see to bring life to a neighborhood that doesn't exist. 
There's also Greenpoint Manufacturing and Design Center in Brooklyn. This is a model where they are a nonprofit industrial real estate developer. This is what they do. They buy old industrial properties and they rehab them and they subdivide them for manufacturers. Small scale, big scale, a thousand square feet, people who have machines who are making things. And they have great, great reputation. They've done seven different buildings. And then there's examples like what we saw, I saw here today, yesterday at Midpoint, right, biotech. So this is the Wake Forest Biotech Center where they rehabbed old R.J. Reynolds buildings and are now these enormous, beautiful research and development labs as a centerpiece in uh, Winston-Salem. But why is this important, right? We've had a history of manufacturing. Maybe some people think, you know, it's old, it's dirty, this isn't important, it's, it's not a thing that we need. Well, there's a couple of key reasons. One is some of these real estate developers, especially for a city, have recognized that people become an amenity for a neighborhood in and of itself. Their decision to put a centerpiece of manufacturing space as the, one of the first phases, planned phases for their development, they said that that's what's gonna draw people to the neighborhood. It's gonna create a cool factor. It's gonna be, put the neighborhood on the map, and that's actually going to increase the value of the office product that they put on afterwards. We also know that having more small-scale businesses in a community creates economic resilience. Huge number of new jobs are from small businesses over the last five years. And we know that the more that people can create homegrown businesses from people who live in the community, who love the community that they're in, and build their businesses there, the more that those businesses stay there. You're not chasing the, the center that's gonna be there for seven years and then leave to the next city because they gave them better tax incentives. And there's a huge movement that I'm sure you've all recognized of local power. People wanna buy stuff made locally. It's hot, it's a market in and of itself. And so there are organizations like SF Made that have been created just to support that local movement, the businesses, the entrepreneurs. What are they making? How do they go to market? How do they scale? But there's a lot of challenges to this work. There's very little industry identity, right? You think manufacturing, most people think warehouses, 100,000 square feet out at the fringe of a city near the airport. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about small scale manufacturing that can be done in the city. Often it's called light industrial, right? It doesn't pollute, it might make noise, but it can be done in buildings like this. There's very little mun municipal support for these initiatives. There are a lot of cities that are talking about entrepreneurship or talking about tech startups, but most cities don't recognize yet that this, they have a history in manufacturing and they could enter back into this space very easily. There's very little support from the entrepreneur community for this. People who are doing the small scale manufacturing are often in their own silos. They do the tech work, they do 3D printing, they create electronics, or they do metal work, or they do woodwork, or textiles, but they don't cross, and they don't meet each other and learn from each other. And there's very little partnership across cities, and there's a huge problem in a lot of cities to find low cost space. A thousand square feet of warehouse space that has the right electric systems and, and uh, HVAC systems, it often gets converted into lofts in a lot of the hard, hot markets. And so thinking about how we protect these spaces, almost like a public good, for our cities, like we do with affordable housing, so that there's affordable workspace in our cities for our producers is a key piece to remember. So how do we create it? I have five steps. <laughs> so it's three or five, right? We first, we have to zone for it. My background's in city planning. I love zoning maps. It's a, it's a malady I have. Um, but one of the key pieces is actually zoning for industrial uses. New York City is probably the most militant about it. 
they, if it's an it's a industrial use, there is nothing else that can go into that space. And even that is starting to get eroded. In most cities, a light industrial zone allows all sorts of other commercial uses and often can just get a waiver to be turned into some other use. If we erode all of these zones in our cities, there will be no affordable manufacturing spaces in our cities. The second is we have to provide financing tools for it. This is just a beginning of the list that I've started to look at. But we have to figure out how to make the spaces exist, and they have to be affordable to the people who need to lease the spaces. It needs to connect to the history of the place. And this is very important. There are a lot of cities that are talking about innovation districts. But the important part to think about, especially when you're looking at manufacturing, is to think about what's the history of what was made in that city. Was anything made there? What was it? This his city has a huge history of engineering and of manufacturing. And it's a perfect fit for different businesses to be here that are making things. And then we need to support business development. There are all sorts of tools online that support this kind of development, both in terms of systems for a community, like the Startup Communities book, um, but also like Kickstarter or Etsy, right? You can go to market tomorrow. And then last but not least, we need to provide job training. There are wonderful entrepreneurship programs, but there's also apprenticeship programs. Can we take people who are from our disadvantaged communities and put them in apprenticeship programs and let them learn a skill so that they can then also create their own businesses or be in this field? And above all, we have to remember that it's about people. It's about giving people an opportunity to create something, to create a business themselves that isn't a high bar of entry anymore. It's a very simple step for people to be able to make things start at home. You wouldn't believe the number of people I've met who are producing in the evenings and weekends, and their dream one day is to actually be a full-time producer. And so I charge you all to think about how we can bring small-scale manufacturing back to each one of our cities. Think about it as that public good, and think about the responsibility we have to harness this opportunity for our city's economies. Thank you very much.